How's it going, guys? Appreciate you guys coming out. I'm excited to be here. My name is Steven Pesavento, and we're going to talk about the investor mindset. We're going to talk about what it means to think like an investor and how when you think like an investor, it leads to the success that you want in your business, in your life, and of course, in your investment portfolio. So what I'm curious about is understanding where you guys are at, what you've invested in, what you came out here for. I know you guys all just got riled up networking and sharing that. So I'd love to hear from a couple of you guys on what you're doing. So let's see, how about you first? I have no investments. Uh, I've come here because I'd like to uh, learn how to invest out of state uh, instead of California. Um, it's a good choice. I'm looking forward. <laughs> yeah, it's a good choice, right? Uh, yeah, looking to really just connect, meet some friends, maybe, maybe some mentors, uh, provide some um, a value uh, within myself as well. I love it. What about you, Brendan? I do fix and flips, and I do birds in uh, Indiana, 50 miles from Indianapolis to Indianapolis. Chris, what about you? I do lending, and uh, that's commercial, residential, business financing, uh, a little bit of personal investing here in Los Angeles, and I'm looking to Love it. How many of you have been investing for over 10 years in real estate? Let's see the hands up, just so I can understand. Who's more than five years in real estate? What about more than two years investing in real estate? One year? And everyone raise your hand if you've never invested in real estate, but you're interested in doing so. Your own house doesn't count because your own house is not an investment. Your own house is a consumer purchase because you're paying for it. Unless you bought it like an investment and plan to flip out of it and make money and do a renovation, but that's the biggest fallacy that we've all been taught is that if we go out and buy something and have the bank come in and fund it, that we're gonna pay for it, that somehow it's an investment. But we're gonna talk about some of the other things that people misperceive but before we do, I wanna just let you know how to get the most out of tonight's conversation. You know, I flew in from Denver to be here to kind of share this with you. So I think the thing that I've found is that if you have a pen and paper, you have a phone, take notes and make note of what things you're gonna do and apply. Because what I'm gonna to share tonight is not profound. It's not something that you've never heard before. But what I can guarantee is the principles, the rules, the guidelines I'm gonna share with you are things that you likely are not doing at 100%. And I know that because I'm not doing it at 100%. And I study this and I obviously have the track record that I'm gonna share with all of you guys. We can always be doing better. And when we write things down, we take action on them, we create a habit, and that habit makes it an automatic thing that we do. So that we're not thinking about it, we're just doing it. We're making that decision from that right place. And the second thing is, after I share a little presentation with some education, I really want to engage in a conversation with you. I want to hear about some of the case studies of things that you guys are working on, some of the beliefs or fears that are coming up, and I want to talk about it because I guarantee you somebody else in the room is feeling the same way. So are you guys all up for that? Yeah. Amazing. So my story, why I'm here, Again, my name is Steven Pesavento. I live in Denver, Colorado. I was born in a small town in Minnesota to two amazing parents who loved me dearly but hated each other. The oldest of four kids, very chaotic upbringing, moved every couple of years, people coming and going, and money was one of the clearest things that we didn't have. But fortunately, that pain, that suffering creates a drive. And so no matter where you're starting from, what I can tell you is that if you can get connected emotionally to the change you wanna make, like anything's possible. So I've bought over $200 million of real estate. When I first started, I had never owned a property in my life. I had no money of my own. And that first year, I bought over 75 properties. Flipped over 75 properties in two states that I didn't live in, all because I came to a Phoebe meeting in Long Beach. 
and I made a decision to get off the couch and say, I'm doing real estate 100%, there's nothing that's gonna stop me, and I fired all my consulting clients, I had no other way to make money before I showed up at that meeting like an idiot, but knowing myself, I needed to cut off all other options. I met somebody there, I convinced them to share some of their experience with me in exchange, I did what I could do for them to add value, and in, in return, by showing up to these meetings, people kept seeing that every time I came, I had something new to share. And so that's the biggest piece of advice I can give as you come to these meetings. The best person to be is the person who's doing something, who's taking action, even if it's not working. So since then, you know, I run a private equity company. We invest primarily in value add multifamily in the Colorado and Midwest market. The reason I got out of flipping houses is because when you do 200 houses in two and a half years out of state, it'll burn your brain out. I was done. I was like, there's too much risk in this. We're really good at it. We bought all those houses off market, sending hundreds of thousands of mailers a month, cold calling, everything you can think of. And I built like a really solid team, but I only was able to do that because I showed up to events like this. I convinced somebody, they saw that drive. They had been building and flipping houses for 15, almost 20 years, thousands of them. And I was able to partner with that person. I was able to take my vision and drive and pack it alongside their track record so that I could go out and pitch that we could actually do this. And I raised about $30 million of private money over that two and a half, three year period. And we were able to do some things. But no matter where you're starting from, you don't need to be the owner with the title in order to do it. Because I called myself the director of marketing because I was 24 years old. So, what we're gonna talk about today is how to think like an investor. So we're gonna talk about these principles or these rules, but there's hundreds more that we're not gonna get into today, but maybe we'll get sprinkled in, in the conversation. And I'm gonna talk about some examples of how it's applied in my life, how I've seen other people do the same. And again, I just encourage you to really think for yourself, like, oh, I, I, I've heard that before, but am I doing it? Is this like a regular practice in my everyday life? So one of the first and most important things which you guys are doing by being here is investors, they gain skills, knowledge, and experience. They become obsessed with the niche that they're focused on. If you're flipping houses, you know everything about construction, about evaluating houses, about running comps, about working with appraisers, about putting capital together, Every detail you possibly can learn, you want to gain all of that knowledge. But then you actually have to apply it before it becomes experience. And once you put those two together, then that's wisdom. So once you have the experience, you've done something so many times, you get a huge advantage. Because no matter what's happening in the market, no matter if interest rates are 550% higher than they were before, that creates an opportunity because someone's problem, there's profit in solving it. So how do you get here? Well, you show up to events like this, you listen to every podcast you can get your hands on. When I was starting, I had an earbud in my ear from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed. In between conversations, my roommate tells me stories about how annoying it was, but he was like, you just had to learn. You go to the library and you get a library card at every single place from LA to Orange County so you can rent books from multiple different places and get access to everything for free. Like money is not the reason that you're not gonna be successful. It's, it's a lack of that knowledge and experience and putting yourself in that position to be able to show to other people like, this guy's gonna do it with me or without me so I wanna hitch my wagon to his. So that's, that's the biggest thing because it's the foundation everything comes out of. When you gain that skills and knowledge you can look at a deal in a market, in a niche, in a sub-niche that you work in and know immediately, if I can buy this for 110 a door, I'm gonna make a killing. Because I know I'm gonna sell it at 180 and I might be able to sell it at 200 a door. And if I do that and it's a 10 unit or a 50 unit or a 200 unit, I mean, that's millions and millions of dollars of profit. But it becomes faster the more that you do it. So you gotta like go out and learn it and then go on the MLS and underwrite and make offers on every deal that you're never gonna get 
And that's how you get to the point where you start feeling comfortable. So the second thing that is really important to understand is that investors adapt to the market quickly. So what do I mean by adapt to the market quickly? What I mean is that whenever you're playing the game of investing, there's a set of rules. Those rules come from what's happening in the economy, it comes from what's happening in the, the, the local jobs and, and investments that are happening. It comes from the debt, it comes from all these different places. And so the rules are constantly changing. And the biggest mistake that I see new investors make, the biggest mistake I see experienced investors make, is they get connected to the old game. They were playing a game, they were loving the game they were playing, and the interest rates went up by 500%, and they're like, I don't want to play this game anymore. Instead of being able to recognize that, cool, the rules changed, nobody's going to tell me the rules changed, I just need to have the skills, knowledge, and experience to recognize it, and be able to step back and say, cool, interest rates just went up 500%, how do I make sure everything in my portfolio is secure? That I can hold on to everything if shit hits the fan. And second, how do I look at my specific unique advantage, the thing that I am the best at or my team and partner is the best at, and how do I use that to go find an opportunity? So after interest rates went up, you know, we went from flipping houses way back in the day to buying two to 300 unit multifamily buildings. And why do we do that? We did it because flying to North Carolina or Minneapolis for me personally to go check on the portfolio, it was too much risk. I had to rely on low paid or high paid employees, other people's judgment on where my money or my client's money was going. But when I'm buying a two or 300 unit building and it's 20 or 50 or 100 million dollars, it's no big deal. Jump on a plane, a thousand bucks on a hundred million dollar transaction is not going to break the bank for the deal. But when the market shifted, all of a sudden, the big institutions have a huge war chest of money that they've been raising during this period where money was essentially free, and they need to deploy that money to show their LPs that they shouldn't just call it back and ask for their money back to justify the fees. So what we noticed was that in the mid-sized multifamily market, in the maybe as small as 20 units, up to 80 to 100 units, in particular in Colorado, but very true in the Midwest, that those institutions were on to write a 20 or 30 or $40 million check minimum. But if we can come in below that, if we can buy deals that require a $10 million check or a $5 million or God forbid as small as a million dollar check, there's not a lot of other people who can do that. There's not a lot of other people who have the relationships with the banks, because the banks aren't lending. There's not other people who can raise capital quickly or have the track record or to be able to show the sellers that this deal is actually going to get done. So we shifted to a new opportunity and by doing so we were able to create returns between 30 and 40 percent last year on the deals that we've already exited which were planned to be held for 36 months but one of those deals we've already exited in nine months. We have another deal going to market that will exit at an even higher rate of return. So the point is when you can recognize the rules of the, change, the, the game change and you can just adapt to it instead of fight it, there's huge opportunity. So whenever there's blood in the street, what do you do? What do you do when there's blood in the street? You buy. And you buy even when it's your own blood. Because that's the best time. Everyone else is running away. Everyone else just finished battle. They think they're done. But if you run in after, you are able to clean up on what everyone else is afraid to make a move. And that's how you make money is you only can do that if you have the knowledge and experience that you know confidently you can solve that problem. So the third thing is investors, they know their numbers. So Chris, tell me why is it important to know your numbers as an investor? You've got to calculate your margin. Yep, you got to be able to calculate your margin. You got to be able to, to underwrite the deal. What about you, Marcus? Just to know if it's a deal worth investing in or not. Yeah, so you got to know your numbers when it comes to the deal. You got to be in a position to be able to look at that and say, well, here's where the comparables are at. If it's a flip, here's where the comparable rents are. If it's a rental, 
Here's where I might be able to stretch and hit a higher number, but here's where I know 100% that I can hit it so that I, I'm covering the downside. There's upside there, but my minimum is here, and then you gotta know it on construction and all the different pieces that go into it. So when you're operating or you're making an investment, you gotta know how to analyze the deal. But the other side of it that is often overlooked goes in towards the plan. You gotta know your numbers of what it is that you actually need to create the life you wanna live. Because going back to the whole reason why you're here, it's not to invest in real estate. Real estate's just a vehicle. We could drive a Ferrari, we could drive a Prius, I hope not. We could drive a BMW, we could get there in a bunch of different ways. This one happens to be secure and long-term and it's a hard asset and there's all these benefits. But when you get clear on the purpose of why you're actually investing, and you get clear on that vision, it can really open up a whole nother fuel for you. And most importantly, you're actually probably not that far away from your goal. Because when you know your number, when you think to yourself, maybe this is really small to you, maybe this is really big, but you think to yourself, for the life that I, I wanna live where I'm comfortable, all I need is $10,000 a month. I need that $10,000 to come every single month, I need to know it's there, and I can live a pretty good life. Maybe that number is 20, maybe it's 40, maybe it's 50. Whatever it is, if you get clear on what that number really is, you can back into how to get there. So what's cool about naming your number is that when you name your number, you can start seeing that you're not that far off. Because to get to $10,000 a month, every single month for the rest of your life, all you need to have is $1.6 million invested at 8% into a cash flowing real estate deal that you know it's gonna pay, or a fixed income note that you know it's gonna pay, and you're gonna have that income. That doesn't mean you have to stop there. That doesn't mean it's the limit. But what's cool is to get to 1.6 million, all you have to do is double your money four times. You have to double it, 100,000 turns into 200,000, 200,000 turns into 400,000, 400,000 turns into 800,000, and 800,000 turns into 1.6. So if you compound it over five years, you're gonna take 100 grand and turn it into 1.6 million in 20 years. But if you can compound it in three years, you'll be there in 12. And that's just one single investment of $100,000 that continues to compound over time. So imagine what you can do if you're making 100 or 200 or $300,000 a year and you have a plan where you're gonna park 100 grand a year into something that you know is gonna pay off in the future. And the best part is when you're investing that money, if you're smart about it, you can make that money without having to pay taxes because the tax system itself is just a treasure map. It's just a treasure map that the government says, we can't actually control you guys, but we can influence you. We can create these different programs to say, hey, we need real estate, let's give them depreciation. We need oil, let's give them some write-offs if they're drilling for oil. So there's all these different pieces of the tax code. And when you look at it as a map, and you realize that the government is your business partner, you can figure out how to be in a position where you do what they want and you get what you want. The fourth thing is when you know your numbers, when you're doing due diligence, you can start understanding, well, where is the risk in the deal? So if you're doing a deal and you're the one who's buying that single family house and you're gonna rent it out or you're gonna flip it, you need to know, well, where's the risk in the deal? How do I know that I'm gonna be in that position to make sure that I can get the return I want? Or if you're looking to invest in a fund or a syndication where there's professional managers who are handling all of those responsibilities, they've gained all that skills and knowledge, you still need your own so that you can do dil due diligence on them. So you can understand what's their track record, what's their experience, how, have they, how long have they been doing this, how many exits have they had? Where has things gone wrong? How have they responded to it? What are their personal values? And most importantly, what does your gut say? Because at the end of the day, a lot of times, your gut's gonna tell you something, and if you just listen to it, man, life will be so much easier. But the key thing to understand is that you gotta manage risk when you're an investor, and this applies in all areas of life, right? When you're investing, the whole point of the game is don't lose money. 
If you lose money, if you have a 70% loss, you have to have a 300% gain to get back to break even. So if you're focused on managing risk, that doesn't mean you can't get a high return. You need to find the deals that have the lowest return with, or the lowest risk with the highest return. And you can only know that if you have the experience or the relationships to work with people who can help you do that. But this applies in other areas of life. You're gonna make investments of time. You've made an investment of time coming here. You drove in from down the street or the South Bay or wherever you're coming from and you chose to come here and you came with the intention of getting a return. Return on your time, return on your effort, on energy. Maybe you're an introvert, even talking to people sucks. You know, like it's scary, but you know you're here for a reason. And so when you use that, you can think, hey, how do I make sure I get the most out of this experience? How do I cover the loss? How do I cover that downside? And it's really important to be able to do that. And one of the key ways that you do that is by being emotionally disciplined. Because one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make, which I've said four times now, is that they buy high and they sell low. 70% of retail investors in the stock market buy high and sell low. Are they all idiots? No, but what they are is they're being driven by emotions. They're being driven by their emotions because they're feeling that feeling of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They're feeling like I may have a loss of what I have, and if I lose what I have, then what am I? What, what am I even good for? And you hear about people doing stupid things from stupid places because they're in that emotional state. The key thing is to understand what's your practice for getting emotionally aligned when you're gonna make an investment decision. You can imagine how this is gonna play in when your husband or you're talking to your wife or your kids, if you can come in and recognize, oh, I'm being emotional. Let me feel those emotions, let me walk away, let me not say the thing, let me not make the decision. Let me center myself, maybe it's a meditation practice, maybe it's running, maybe it's boxing, maybe it's anything that works for you, but you find a way to get yourself in that place. So when interest rates went up in 2022, it was scary, especially when you own $200 million of real estate especially when a couple of those properties have floating rate debt. Now fortunately we had caps on that, we had an interest reserve and we had a war chest of money to be able to back, back those properties, but it's still scary. And if, you, if I made those decisions in that moment from a place of fear and scarcity, I would have made the wrong choice. But by being able to center myself, even when everyone else is storming and flying around and saying the wrong thing, to be able to come back to that center and say, hey guys, we gotta fucking go. Like it's time to roll. We need to like work hard. We need to get these things leased up. We need to make things happen because now's not a time to be in fear. Like we don't have time for that. Feel it for a second, but put it away and use it to take some action. And when you can do that, then you can go out and buy when everyone else isn't. Fortunately, those properties are secure. We don't believe we're gonna have any losses. We've never lost investor money. We've returned some incredible returns, but guess what? When you're investing, there's always risk. People think it's like magic that this money just keeps coming in when they invest and they're not actively operating, but like it takes work. And every big bank didn't think interest rates were gonna go up, otherwise we wouldn't have seen the stuff that's happening. But when you can come back and center yourself, you can make a great decision. And you need to be able to do that even when you're new. Because I know that feeling. Should I buy this property? Should I not? Am I underwriting it right? I don't know what I don't know. But it, you're never gonna get experience if you don't start. And then to build on that experience and go again and again. Which leads directly into the importance of investors partnering with and investing in other people. So investing in other people is showing up tonight. It's the person who's done one deal sharing the story with somebody who hasn't. It's the person who's done 200 deals sharing it with somebody who's done 10. And not from a place of comparison. I wanna really underline that. I've had a lot of success in real estate and I'm super grateful for it, but it doesn't solve everything, right? Like you still gotta come 
to this with the right reason and know like, why am I actually doing this? I want to have a good life. I want to have a good relationship. I want to share that with others. I want to make an impact. All of those things are more important than the money. Ironically, the money does support those things. But you want to invest in relationships because the person you're sitting next to or the person you met here could be your next partner. They could be your next funder. They could be the person who refers you to your contractor, to the broker. They could be somebody that you invest $100,000 and turn it into 1.6 million in the next 20 years. You, by investing into those relationships, you're creating political capital. And it may not come back from that person and don't expect it to, but it will come back. The second piece of it is they partner with other people. They go out and they find the strategic partner who has what they don't have. Maybe it's track record and experience. Maybe it's 20 years older, so it seems like it's more legit. Maybe it's they have a whole construction company and property management division, and they know exactly how our business works. And so if I can partner with them and they can take 20 or 30% of the upside, I can get all of their services done at cost. So that's what we did. We've got 50 people on staff at our partner, both on construction and property management, over a decade of them doing exactly what we do. And they make way more money by taking money on the back end because they're investing right alongside of us. But the biggest benefit is that we're all aligned. And so when you can have partnerships where there's an alignment of interest, where every person in that firm the property management firm is all tied into the back end of the deal. Even if it's a little bit and they're just a leasing agent, everybody's making a little bit of money. So they know that when I save a dollar, that leads to $5 of value at the property. So the key is no matter if you're partnering with a fund or a syndicator, or you're partnering with someone who you're going to lend money to, that you put yourself in that position to look for that alignment. Where can I add value? Where can they add value? How can we come together? How can we make money doing it? And a great example for us is, could I have done any of this if I didn't have partners? No. I didn't have the money. I didn't have the experience. I didn't have the name or the tracker. I didn't have the family connections. I didn't have any of it. But I built it slowly. I added value first and received it back in return. And then over time, that put me in a position to then ask others to do the same. And we have hundreds of investors who have invested millions and millions and millions of dollars with us. And it blows my mind sometimes thinking that I have a podcast that has millions of downloads and somehow people wire me money without meeting me. Like, it's fucking wild. <laughs> like, what? But then it's even cooler to meet them in person and like hear about their life and their wife and their kids and selling the business and they're living the life that they want to live because of some of the work we do. So it feels really cool and you can be in that same position whether you're the person who's lending money or investing or you're the person who's creating that opportunity if you want to make real estate your job. I'll admit, most people here are not going to want to build a firm and do all the work and all the effort that goes into it. Getting a couple properties here and there and building wealth is phenomenal, but there is something really beneficial if you are that person who wants to build that machine that people can buy money by investing in your firm. Now there's risk in buying money, but that's what they're doing. They're buying the future that they want and you can be the person who can guide them there if that's what you want to do. Or you can be the person who takes advantage and makes 60, 70, 80% of the profit without doing any work. You know, either one's not a bad place to be. And then the final of these rules is that investors, they create ROI in everything they do. I mentioned this earlier, that by coming here, you're looking for a return on investment. Even if you didn't think about it, even if you didn't think, hey, this is the specific return I'm trying to get, this is the result I'm trying to get, the more clear you can be about the ROI you're looking for, the better you can be about making decisions. Because if you have that plan, and you know your number, then you're in a position to be able to say, mm, I need cash flow right now. I'm 65, I got three million bucks in the stock market, it's not paying me anything. If I could just take a little bit of, out of that out and put it into something, maybe I start slow and I just start feeling what it's like to get that cash flow, build that trust, the relationship, start pouring more of that in, or maybe you just flip the switch and all of a sudden now, you know, with three million bucks, you almost have 20 grand a month coming in. So 
when you think about ROI, you think about it from a monetary standpoint, you think about it from a time standpoint, you think about it from a relationship standpoint. Like the whole reason you're looking to invest is because you wanna like do something cool or fun or travel or Christina wants to spend time with her, her daughter at 2 p.m. having the flexibility to be able to choose. Like it's a really powerful place to be in and when you can connect to the real purpose of why you're doing this, it can become a huge motivator. And I'll tell you, when I started, I started doing this from a place of pain. I started it because I felt like I had to. I had to prove to myself that I was worthy, that I could get out of that. And then things change in life. Then somebody passes away or you have a new experience and you realize like what life is really about. And then you find a new fuel, you let go of that pain that used to be the superpower and you find a positive fuel. And there's huge ROI in that. Like if I kept holding on to that pain that made me a fucking animal when it came to like building the business, like it felt good and I miss it sometimes. But over time I saw that, okay, I could have a better relationship with my lady. I can have a family. I can have more than just work. I can have a life. And when you can connect to that, you can see the ROI is so much bigger. I gotta let go of that. That old way, that doesn't work for me. I'm happier, I'm better, and now I've got a different reason why I'm doing these things, and it'll move you forward. And at the end of the day, all investors do is they're creating value. When I buy a 50 unit apartment building in Denver, this is a rough one. When I buy a 50 unit apartment building in Denver that I can't even tour because there's drug dealers that are gang banging and guns and hookers and all kinds of nasty stuff. I can't even look at the building, but I know there's money because I started with skills and knowledge and expertise. I know there's an opportunity there. If I can go in and just get those people out, the property's worth way more money before I even do anything to it. And because I've done that before, I know how to deal with it. Now, most of our projects aren't that rough, right? Most of the projects are, somebody's been owning it for 10 years and they've been making good money and they've been pulling cash flow out and they haven't been reinvesting in renovating the units or updating them. So rents are 800 bucks when the market is 16. And when we get done with our work, we can usually push it 50 to 100 bucks more. So there's always an opportunity, but we receive that value back in return because we're creating it. I make a better place for someone to live, so I attract a better tenant. I attract somebody who has pride in the place that they're living. They get a feeling like I'm moving up in the world or I have a stable place or I have a good management company behind me. It's clean, it's safe, all of those good things. The kind of place I'd be happy for my mom to live if she needed to, but it's affordable because the new stuff that they're building in Colorado and the new stuff they're building in the Midwest, they have to spend so much money on it because of the cost of development, so they can't develop a building for as cheap as we can rent these. So we're in a different level of competition, and so in return, we can charge more money in rent. If we charge more money in rent, the value of the building goes up. If the value of the building goes up, we can either refinance and pull out the money, or we can be in a position to sell it and the person who's buying it doesn't want any problems, so they're willing to pay more. And then in return, the investors get paid and we get a percentage of that profit share. So it's a full cycle thing and when you can start thinking about life from this place, like how can I create value for the next person that I meet? How can I ask them what they're excited about, where they have problems, how can I make a connection for them? How can I be a person of value? And not looking for it in return, but being open to it coming being open to that introduction, that person who says, you know what, Steven said he was looking for strategic capital partners. I, I got someone, I'm gonna introduce them. I I'm gonna connect the, I don't have the money to invest, I don't, I don't wanna do that right now, but I'm gonna make that introduction because it's beneficial for him, and I know that if I'm in that state of giving, I will begin to receive in return. So it's, it's really powerful, it'll change your life if you start thinking like an investor because it's not about the money, but the money follows when you start living like this. So I'm gonna share two quick examples. I've talked a little bit about these, so we'll breeze through them, and then 
I really would like to hear from you guys and, and what you're working on. But in 2022, interest rates shifted, the market changed. Sellers wanted what they wanted or thought the property was worth yesterday. Buyers want what they think it's gonna be worth in three years, right? They want a big discount. So what happened was 80% reduction in sales volume in multifamily, 80% reduction, meaning people are not buying, people are not selling. That means the 20% are either institutions that are buying and paying more than it's worth because they gotta park the money and justify to the pension that they raise that money from, the 2% fee they're charging on the money that they're doing their job, or that person is in distress. They're either in personal distress, death, divorce, disease, family issues, anything. The property's in distress, it's not being managed well, property management issues, gang bangers, or there's debt distress. They've got debt that's coming due and they're not gonna be able to refinance it or they don't have money to put up for a rate cap. So there's a problem at the property which creates a huge opportunity. And so like I said, we shifted our model and we said, hey, it takes way more work and effort to buy these 50 or 100 unit buildings than it does to buy a two or 300 unit building. But if we package up a bunch of these, we'll get all of our team working hard, we can keep everybody employed, but more importantly, we can buy stuff at deep discounts, 60 to 70% of the current value. We can go in, fix it up, and then there's buyers who wanna buy that who are trying to get out of crazy states like California and Washington and Oregon and New York. And they think Denver's better, they think the Midwest is better, and they're gonna tend their own exchange in. And they've got a tight timeline. So they're gonna pay more because of that because they know they gotta deploy the money. So what we did was we shifted that model and in return, we were able to buy some stuff at a deep discount and it ended up leading to a big opportunity for the firm. So the way we created value is we found a blue ocean. Where is everybody buying? Where is nobody buying? Where are we really good? Boom, we're gonna, we're gonna target in on that specific niche within a niche within a niche. We knew the market so we knew what neighborhoods are seeing growth, we know what neighborhoods we believe in, we know what neighborhoods people don't believe in, but there's huge investments from corporations or the government, like there's one street in Denver in particular where the city of Denver is committed to spend a billion dollars to revitalize that area. Used to be a place you and I would not go during the day or at night. And now those buildings are selling for two or $300,000 a door in a neighborhood that a few years ago was pretty rough. We understood our advantage, and most importantly, we had aligned interests. The sellers had a problem, they needed it solved. They don't like selling it for less than it's worth, but after one buyer falls out and a second buyer falls out or a third buyer falls out and we are still there, hanging around the hoop, waiting for that rebound, saying, hey, we got the money, we can do it. Boom, problem solved. Investors, great, you're gonna get 80% of the profit. Problem solved. We get to keep working, we get to keep our team busy, and most importantly, we're buying a valuable asset. And then fifth is we acted quickly. Nobody that I know was buying discounted deals in 2022. I know a handful of people who I won't mention by name that were buying big deals in 2022, and I know because I looked at the underwriting, the deals didn't make sense. They were buying the deals because they needed to keep paying their people. Huge, huge mistake. But because we acted quickly, we were able to take advantage and be that only buyer, that last buyer of choice, last resort buyer, and we were able to clean up and add a ton of assets to the portfolio. And that still is going on right now. Like, I just got off a call with a broker in Denver, and the broker is desperate. The seller is being a jerk. I know it was under contract for a lot more. We're, we keep offering less and less. We keep dropping our offer and they keep coming back to the table to talk to us because there's nobody else who's trying to buy value at because they don't have the team or the construction or they don't have the debt relationships or they don't have a fund with 10 or $20 million just ready to go, ready to deploy. So we were able to take advantage of that. And then of course we covered the downside. And the, the last example, and the way I want you to think about both of these is not cool, I'm glad you did that, but I want you to think about what are the, what are the 
What are the thoughts or ideas that I can apply in my own business, that I can apply in my own real estate? Or more importantly, that I can apply when I'm looking to find opportunities to invest in? Because one of those examples is in 2022, everybody's scared. People invested in 2022 are feeling like I just bought at the top of the market, maybe I should sit back and wait. They're buying high, they're waiting to sell low, they're waiting to buy until it's high again. They're being idiots, because they're being emotional. But I understand where they're coming from. So I thought to myself, hey, what does everybody want in the investment industry? They all want a guarantee. Well, we can't guarantee any, we can't do a guarantee of return, that's illegal. So I thought, okay, well, how can we show that we're really aligned and we believe in the strategy? Great, we're gonna figure out a way that we can create a principal protection program where when people invest into a deal, we can't guarantee that you're gonna make money, but we can guarantee that we won't make money if you're not making money. And that sounds all good and fine in one deal, but really, that doesn't really benefit them or us. We want them to invest in two or three or five or 10 deals. We want them to continue to make those ongoing investments. So when they invest in a deal, what it does is it turns every deal they've invested in us in, a deal they've invested with us in, into a fund. Where if we make huge profit on one deal and we lose money on the other deal, nothing happens because they're up. But if we lose money on one deal and we lose money on this deal, but they're invested in two other deals and we make a profit, we're not gonna take a profit share in the, until they're 100% even. And the craziest thing about this program is that nobody's doing it, but it seems like such an obvious thing. Like, when I was flipping houses, out of the 200 houses we did, there's only two properties we ever lost money on. But we paid our investors the full rate of return that we had projected because one of them was our mistake, we just, took too long, it was a little bit too risky of a deal, it was like a California mansion, 7,000 square feet in like a little town in Raleigh. It was stupid, but we thought we could make some good money on it. And, but we paid them what they were due, even though we didn't win, right? But in the end, those people invest with us forever, because they know we're gonna do the right thing. So all I did was write down what I already was gonna do and put it in writing as a contract that says, hey, as long as we don't go bankrupt, we're never gonna profit if you lose money. Like, we're gonna pay you back, it's the right thing to do. And so the value that was created was we understood our market, we understood what people wanted, what's the fear that they're experiencing, how can we reverse the risk of that fear? How can I, as the, the owner of the company, take on that risk, saying, hey, you know, sometimes things don't work out, but we're, we're gonna, we got your back. So that makes people feel more comfortable, especially if they were in a deal and, and they were feeling like uncertain, we want them to take advantage of buying at the bottom. So we created an incentive to reduce the risk for them to continue to invest. And as a result, majority of our investors, 85% reinvestment rate. Huge, huge results. Because we said, hey, we're gonna do what we say we're gonna do, we're gonna write it down, we're gonna show you who we are and we've aligned interests and nobody else is doing it. Like my belief, as you're seeing on tape, I believe the industry is gonna change. I believe that other people are gonna take on this strategy and I encourage them to do it because this is the right thing to do. People shouldn't be profiting if their investors aren't profiting. And so in the end, do what's right. Remember, add value and value will come back to you. So that's what it means to think like an investor. And uh, I'd love to hear from you guys. Chris. Good question. So in 2019, I started looking for deals off market, same strategy I did in single family. I thought, dude, this is gonna be easy. I bought 200 properties, I'm sending 100 mailers a month, 100,000 mailers a month, I know how to operate and have these conversations. 
then I realized like, oh, different asset class, totally different game. Institutional sellers are not looking to sell at a discount. At that time in the market, they're definitely not looking to sell to somebody they just called. And the brokers are making those calls every single day. There's 100 brokers in this city alone that are calling an owner every day of the week from multiple people saying, hey, I can pay you a million dollars, I can get a buyer to pay a million dollars more than it's worth. So me coming in trying to buy at a discount, I sound like an idiot. So that didn't work. So we shifted and said, hey, what do we already have? We already have a track record. We already have a bunch of people who have invested as, as debt into our deals. How can we bring them into a multifamily deal? So we went to the traditional broker, had them shop for deals. We got a deal under contract and we went to that existing network. Those individual people that I had met at events or had listened to the podcast or had invested with us in the past, they said, hey, this is what we got. It's very similar to what we've done in the past, it's just bigger. How much did you raise initially? That first raise, we raised about two and a half million bucks, which seemed like a lot of money at the time. And then the next deal we raised about four and a half million, the next deal we did seven million and we did another six million at the same time. And that year we ended up getting up to about 20 million of AUM and we've just continued to grow it since then. Did you offer a minimum return on an initial raise to an million? So the way that it works is you either invest in debt, which is gonna get you a fixed rate of return, but oftentimes no upside. You're in a lower risk position because you think lower risk debt, mes debt, meaning a second position loan, pref equity, means you get a set rate of return, and then traditional common equity. Highest risk, highest return. Doesn't necessarily mean, highest risk doesn't mean that it's a super risky deal, but they're participating in the upside of the deal, but their downside is limited to whatever they invested. So the way it worked was we offered an 8% preferred return, meaning they get the first 8% of any cash flow or exit, and then after that, they would get 70% of the profit, we would get 30, and then after we hit a 15% return, we would get 50% of the profit. So because of the people that we were raising money from, that structure worked, it was incentivizing to them because they said, hey, after I make 15, these guys are gonna be super motivated to make sure I get 15. So if we get 20, great, of that 5%, we're gonna make 2.5% of that. So it becomes a huge win-win. And then as we've scaled, we've created different levels so somebody can come in with as something as small as $100,000, which is really kind of like a starter investment for us, or 500 or a million or more than that. So you just kind of start wherever you're at, but really it's about building relationships, talking about the strategy, showing that you're that kind of person who like is gonna make things happen. And what I found is the more experienced someone is as an investor, especially like as a limited partner and investor, especially if you're just getting started, they're gonna watch what you do. They're gonna like, hey, let me just watch you do a couple deals. They see the deals, they see the results, they check in, they ask for the reports, and then all of a sudden, boom, they'll drop like a million bucks into your account. So it's kind of like you're always having conversations, you're always building those relationships. But then for me, what was different was because I had a podcast back in 2019, where I still have it, that was generating huge downloads. Like we were on the top 500 podcasts for almost a year and a half. We're new and noteworthy, so we're getting all these people who are getting introduced to us as a company, but more importantly, they're getting introduced to me. Were your investors private investors? Were they accredited? When we started, we did take some non-accredited investors, but as we've grown, we only accept capital from accredited investors, and that's for two reasons. One, compliance. It's safer for us. And two, because of the thought process of with, with having a boutique firm and not being able to have 10 people on investor relations to answer questions, we wanna focus that effort in on those people who over time will be able to continue to grow as an investor with us. So you just start wherever you start, no matter how big or small, and what's surprising is even if you get a $25,000 check from somebody, you recognize like that's their 25,000. Like they worked for that. 
maybe that's a lot of money to them. You never take all of somebody's money or even more than 10 or 20% of it, but you appreciate whatever it is and over 10 years or so, you know, that, that grows. They make more money, they see the results, they invest, they make referrals, connections, they tell their brother or their coworker and all of a sudden now you got the boss of their company who's investing and so this referral engine starts once you start showing results and that personal relationship goes a long way. Any other questions? Otherwise, <laughs> I think we'll come back to you, Chris. I feel like you got some other good ones. I just want to know how old are you, man? I'm 34. 34? Yeah. It's pretty good. <laughs> I wish I started earlier. I'll <laughs> do. Um, my only question is, uh, how location specific are you? And if somebody here wants to start, should they look for something that they can do as a joint venture deal? Or should they get this location because there's, it seems like there's much more required that you need to know? Yeah, so when we're investing, we're very location specific because it goes back to rule number one and rule number three, which is I need to know everything I can about the details of that market. I need to get immersed in it. Or I need someone on my team who knows that market, went to college there, knows people there, understands the difference between 5th Street versus 7th Street, and that, oh God, 6th Street, don't go there. Like, you need to know all of those details. And you can get up to speed quickly, especially when you're getting, buying a big building, you can meet with a bunch of brokers and people who live in that area and you can get the rundown. But we specifically and exclusively invest in Colorado and in the Midwest within three hours of Des Moines. So that would be Des Moines, Kansas City, Omaha, Missouri. And we do that because our team is able to drive to those locations, move new people onto those properties when needed from the headquarters and set up shop in those markets. Now we've invested in other markets. What we did in 2022 is we consolidated our focus where do we have the biggest advantage? And let's take advantage of that advantage. Thank you for listening to the Investor Mindset Podcast. If you like what you heard, make sure to rate, review, subscribe, and share with a friend. Head over to the InvestorMindset.com to join the Insider Club, where we share tools and strategies from the top investors and entrepreneurs on how to take it to the next level. 